Welcome to the show. How we doing tonight? IB Nation Sports Talk off and running. I'm Sean Styers. Bobby Hensley is here tonight. Great to have you with us as always. How are you tonight, Bobby? I'm doing terrific. I get to see you. I get to talk to you. Like sometimes it's like once a week. Man, that feels like a long time <laughs> between our visits. Well, you know, I don't know if we've had this. I don't think we've had this conversation on this show before, but <clears throat> you're the worst texter in the world, like responding to text. So like if you include texts as conversations, it's very hard to converse, you know, when, when, when the texts are going one sided. So. Well, one sided. If you say like, Hey, see you Thursday. Am I supposed to reply and well, say, yes, no, I, you I, know. I have received you know, this. You know, when I text you, it's more than that. You know that. Come on now. Come on. It, so I reply, I think, in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Everybody has tears, you know, like the person that you reply to the most, and uh -huh. then the second most, and then you get to it when you get to it. You're the get to it, get to it guy for me. Yeah. Okay. The get to it, get to it guy. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Hey, so I show the, up. That's right. So we've got a big show today. Uh, we're going to review the Manti Teo Netflix documentary are you fired up and and ready to go we've each watched the two parts over the last couple of days i even watched part two twice just to make sure i was absorbing everything are are you ready for it i you know i've seen the youtube chat going on here people are people are pretty fired up it looks like i mean i'm ready to give it a word you're gonna have to help me with part one part two because i watched it straight through okay all right. So you have to break down if that was part one or part two. It's a pretty easy delineation, but we'll 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 you know we're not right. We're not we're not going to get too detailed on you know what came in which part and all that start stuff. But as we start, of course, don't forget hit that like button, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff wherever you watch or listen. It is greatly appreciated. Before we get to Manti Teo and uh, the Netflix documentary few notes coming out of Marcus Freeman's press conference today. They held a scrimmage today, a 90 play scrimmage. Offense won the scrimmage. They uh they they called it a jersey scrimmage. And so the uh since the offense won, they got to keep their blue jerseys, I guess. So there you go. Oh, so they got that going for them. At least there was an incentive because it gave them a reason to try. Yeah. Uh downer note, of course, um, we touched on yesterday Jarrett Patterson being out of practice yesterday. He has a foot injury, and uh, it, it is a sprained foot. Marcus Freeman says they're going to rest it for 7 to 10 days, see if Patterson's able to practice. Um, 10 days would put him back a week from Saturday. So, like, if he sits for, you know, for a full 10 days because he was out yesterday, the day before that, 10 days puts him a week from Saturday, which is exactly one week from the Ohio State game, Freeman says he is questionable for that game. So you've got your best offensive lineman, most experienced offensive lineman, definitely with 34 starts over the last three years. He is potentially going to be out. So they've got Andrew Kristoffic, Rocco Spindler splitting reps at guard. Of course, you've already got Avery Davis out. Like like how like scale of one to ten. How concerning is this, Bobby, when you're just a little bit more than two weeks away from heading to the horseshoe? Well, yeah, I was going to say, it's a good thing they're opening up with a cupcake, right? <laughs> um, I think it's fine, and I think that's almost why you do the scrimmage when you do it, because the guys, you know, they're going to get their bumps and bruises, you know, the next day, and they're going to have time to recover, and then you, can, you get the callus off, kind of, like where you're used to getting hit. And I think that um, that's perfect for them. I if, if, it, if they're being honest, if it really is a week from Saturday, he'll be ready to go. And he still has another week to ramp back up and get ready for game speed. I think it's fine. I think that's why you do this now for those little Nick's, Nick injuries. That's like nothing terrible, nothing that's going to put you out. But it's it's going to be – I think that's why you do it when you do it. Yeah. And, you know, Marcus Freeman said it's going to be basically based on 
how much pain Jarrett Patterson can tolerate, how much pain he's experiencing, and how much he can tolerate. It'll be really interesting to see. You know, somebody on Twitter said, well, can he just take a cortisone shot? And, you know, the, the, well, I'm sure that happens, but this also isn't the NFL, and it's, and it's week one. So as much as you would obviously really love to have Jarrett Patterson out there against Ohio State, you still have at least 11 games, if not 12 more to go, if you get, you know, going to a bowl game after that. So you 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 don't want to, and you know, the guy is just coming back from a torn pectoral muscle as well. So he's, you know, he's, it, it, he's been through so much just to get to this point to be back. And now he sprains his foot. He had a foot injury a couple of years ago at the end of the season that kept him out of the last four games. And he missed the college football playoff game against, um, uh, Alabama, uh, you know, so now he's got another freaking foot injury and it's, you know, it's like you, you just, as much as you'd like to have him out there, I don't think you want to be pushing him back too soon. I, you know, I think Marcus Freeman's right. You know, you, you, you kind of, you kind of put it on him and you make sure that whatever decision is made, that the guy who is involved, Jarrett Patterson is completely comfortable with it. Yeah, but I mean, like I say, that's that's kind of football is a contact sport. Everybody's going to be full contact. Reminds me of Drew Tranquil, who just couldn't seem to get rid of the injury bug, and every year yeah. it was something random. And it, so I think at this point in the season, I'd rather have it now, and then maybe he toughs it out and gets back to 100. percent Because if it happened in the first quarter against Ohio State, you wouldn't really say that he had it the whole. He wasn't in the whole game anyway. So if it's going to happen, I'm happy it's now, and I'm hope, happy it's. Not happy is the right word, but I, I'm grateful that it's going to be an injury that's not long enough that he should be back and good to go by the first game. And if he's not in the first game or if he's on a pitch count, as we say in baseball terms, you, you understand that as well. He he would be still a valuable part of the team and still has the opportunity to play the whole season. Yes. Thank you, Irish One. Smash the like button. He knows where it's at. Um, some other injury updates Logan Diggs the running back he's been in the red jersey for these first two weeks of practice Marcus Freeman said he expects the red jersey to come off next week of course he had the shoulder surgery after the spring so that's really good news like yeah it, 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 get the red jersey off Logan Diggs and he's going to be up and going and ready for that opener against Ohio State you got a full stable of running backs ready to go that's that's like uh kind of offsets this a little bit. It's it, it's pretty exciting to, to think about Logan Diggs continuing to gear up and, and be ready to go for that one. And you almost wonder if you're ever going to get in an opportunity where one of those running backs can make maybe run some routes and become like kind of a slot guy or something like that because I think they of will the, of the weaknesses that they've had from injury at the other position. So any skill guy you're getting, especially one that talented and that fast, I think it's a really good thing and really optimistic. Again, I, you know, those injuries are tough, but, you know, if you can get other guys that can maybe fill out the roster and then talent's talent. If you're fast, you're fast. If you can teach a guy to run the routes, then you might even force a guy that wasn't going to ever be a receiver or anything to become a great one. I'm looking at the positives and the optimistic side of this. You are. This is, this is a new side of you. I don't, it's, it's a side that we very rarely see. So it's, I'm not sure who I'm looking at right now on the other side of that camera you just bring out the positive in me sean <laughs> i guess so uh, <laughs> final note wide receiver Jaden thomas has a tight hamstring he rode the bike yesterday they're kind of easing him back in it's a grade one uh kind of hamstring strain that he has so again you know that's something you obviously don't want to rush you know getting back too soon from a hamstring so they'll take their time fortunately it's warm so that kind of helps out yeah. with the old hammies and stuff like that too yeah, and again, plenty of time to stretch stuff out. I know we're getting hungry and happy about football being here, but in terms of a nagging injury, you still have a couple of weeks. They don't have to play. They can take their time. They can work it out. It's just uh, we're almost there. We're almost a football season. Uh-oh. Yeah, Sean? I better do oh, something here real quick. Hopefully everything goes okay, but I've got to do my internet connection real quick. Well, if not, then I'll just start talking, and there's never a problem with that. I appreciate what what anybody have to say in the chat. Anything going on? Did anybody see the Teo documentary? <laughs> Seems to be the big thing. Oh, I think Sean Frozen kind of looks good anyway. There oh, we go. There, he is. there we go. And I'm back. <laughs> that, that wasn't quite as bad me. as I thought it was going to be. 
everything was spinning on my side, but I, I just realized I've got this horrible home internet where I live. As you well know, you don't live too far away. You've got it too, you know, so you do yours yeah. at a different location. And I have I had to switch to my hotspot, which gives me much better internet connection i was you, worrying that as the show went on we might have some dropouts if i didn't switch so forgot to i feel like my location tonight. today with the blinds i almost look like i'm in uh michael scott's uh office in the, you do in the office you do so all right let's get let's get going on this let's not waste any more time manti teo <laughs> documentary um it hit netflix this week it's called untold the girlfriend who didn't exist it you know we're dealing with a lot of Notre Dame fans, predominant Notre Dame fans. So everyone's pretty much familiar with the story. But this documentary chronicles the whole relationship between Manti and the person he knew as Lene Kakua. Started on Twitter and then Facebook and grew into phone calls over the years. He was obviously, you know, they obviously never met face to face. Um, it was never a girl. It was always a young man named Renaya Tuiasasopo who is a cousin of, like you recognize that last name, Tui Asasopa. Uh, he had some cousins and stuff like that who played in the NFL several years back. But So Manti and Renaya, uh, they were both full participants in this documentary, as was Jack Swarbrick, as well as Tim Burke, who is the reporter who broke the story. He was interviewed, like you were just talking about, part one, part two. That was all in part two when they started talking to the Deadspin guys and all that Um Two parts. The first part basically goes from when they first connected through Manti's freshman, you know, during Manti's freshman year at Notre Dame, goes up until Manti getting a phone call from this person he thought was a girl and thought was dead in early December, just before the Heisman Trophy ceremony, when Johnny Manziel ends up uh, winning the Heisman. Uh, episode two then kind of picks up there. And just chronicles all the craziness, the dead spin reporters, you know, all this stuff. The you know, the, and the, you know, there were some spots maybe where they could have filled in the blanks a little bit more. You know, I don't know if they could have got another full hour out of this thing, but uh, you know, it, it goes through the whole thing: the catfishing scam, the aftermath, Manti going on Katie Couric, uh, Renaya going on Doctor Phil, and you know, doing that whole thing and and doing his slash her voice and and the whole thing so i kind of laid it out bobby just some kind of initial thoughts on this documentary again two part two hours yeah robbie toma thanks derek yeah, uh, robbie, robbie toma, toma um manti's bro from uh, back on the islands he was in it They're probably as got the well. scholarship because he was his bro <laughs> yeah and and some faces you know that that people here locally would recognize saw your boys the, the late great Jeff Jeffers and a young Angelo De Carlo in a sideline shot. Yeah. There was a shot of Dean Hubbard in a uh, local newscast. Uh, I'm trying to think that was pretty much it. I think as far as you know, local people that we saw. I thought we might see you know maybe some more background of some different people and stuff like that. But so that's kind of that's kind of where we are right now. I'll I'll, I'll kind of let you share some of your thoughts first of all. Well. Just the documentary. I, I mean, that's why we're doing this today. That's our topic. But like, there's a, so much to unpack there. We'll get through a lot of it. But I think one of the, the the first thing that came off to me was that Jack Swarbrick sat down for those interviews. For yeah, the interview he did. I don't. And like, I think it was an important guy, piece of it as well to you know to kind of you know again kind of help fill in some of the background and what they knew and and some of those kind of things. But like his his vantage point of the story like he's above it. it it was a player at his place that got into the situation but he could have big timed it and said no i'm not going to do an interview about this and instead he was incredibly candid i thought yeah. he was one of, i mean you didn't have a narrator but i think he was almost the guy that which tied i think it all was together. good i, I like the fact that there wasn't a narrator that they let sure. all these people you know, it was basically the people, you know, the, 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 I'm talking with my hands again. They, you know, they let these people, you know, the main, yeah. the, the main people, Manti, um, Renaya slash Lene. And then you, you, those were obviously the two main ones. The fact that they had those two telling firsthand their stories and then Swarbrick helping fill in some blanks, Robbie Toma kind of giving some background from time to time as well. And then obviously, 
the reporters. I mean, they had the most important people in this whole thing in there. Well, the the the, the series called Untold. I really enjoyed. They've had several stories on there. That wasn't their first, that wasn't their debut into the documentary business of sports. Some of the other stories they've told, they the, what makes the story so good. And Netflix in general, when they do a documentary, they won't do it unless they get all the key players. And that's really interesting to me. I just something about Jack Swarbrick wasn't what I expected. And then another takeaway I had, uh, not to be too controversial, but it said at the beginning of the screenings, we didn't know or the beginning of the interviews that that they were trans or became a woman after. So well, I'm wondering what the timeline was of all the interviews. That was the only th that kept sticking out to me because obviously the story's over and dead. It's in the past. Yeah. But when did they interview everyone? And then when they interviewed Teo, was he first? And then they knew what to ask other people. Well, I kind of wondered about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some of that stuff kind of happens all the time. Just like, sure. you know, with, with the Michael Jordan thing a couple of years yeah. ago, it's like, they talk to this guy and you just like remember the iPad and and mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yep. And you know, then they go back and, and they went back and to him. Yeah. Apparently, now I was able to get some extra background information. And again, there are some blanks in the documentary. For example, from the time the email tip came into Deadspin to the time they broke the story, you know, they didn't lay that it out at all in the documentary. Like if you were gonna guess how long. In any guess that you would, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, any guess that you would have, like how long that took them digging up all that information and going from getting the tip to publishing the story? I mean, if you're asking me, there's two questions that you just asked. One, what did the documentary make it look like, how long it was? And two, how long was it actually? Right. And I don't know either answer, so I'm going to throw two answers at you. Okay. The documentary, I think, almost made it seem like it took them weeks, like maybe a week and a half, two weeks. Mm -hmm. And in my heart... I feel like it probably was only a day or two, if that. A little more than a day or two. It was five days. And that's because Tim Tim Burke, again, the author of the Deadspin story, I listened to an interview with him this morning on uh, the SI Sports Media podcast with Jimmy Traina. He went on there and, and you know, they, they actually spent a lot more time, like, talking about his background and what he does than the actual documentary. But that was the biggest detail I was able to take out of that. It only took him five days and really less than five days to dig all this stuff up. But this guy, like you saw in the documentary, he literally sits in a room and he says he has miles, you know, of coaxial and cable and all this stuff. And he's got multiple computers and satellite feeds in there. He does a lot of, you know, like he obviously knows how to access information that not everyone knows how to access. But he said he worked from like 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. that first day. And then the other guy, you know, so like he's working on one thing. The the other guy, I think his name was Jack Dickey or something like that, was working mm -hmm. on the one that trying, the to, trying to figure out who the person in the photo was, the photo that they were using, you know, supposedly Lene Kakua. And her name was Diane O'Meara, as uh, Brandon points out. And, you know, she was the girl in the picture. She went to high school with Rania. Mm -hmm. he, he knew her a little bit, but not really well. And so that's how that, you know, whole thing started out. That's how she got to be the person <laughs> in the photo. But it only took five days for them to research all that. And, but in general, I think that it. where Rania messed up, if you want to call it whatever, is that they, they've created all these profiles in this, this fictitious world, which we all know about. They tied themselves to it by adding themselves as a friend. If you were one, like if you were going to make all these profiles and you'd never wanted to get caught, it seems like you could just not connect yourself to it, yeah. have a different world to it. But they, they, I think that the overall vibe was, was a little bit off because it's like, well, okay, well, why'd you add yourself as a friend on this fake profile? And why would you contact the person of the pictures you're using? There's too many crumbs being dropped that it's going to come back to you eventually. You know it's going to hit you. Yeah, so, you know, like, I know a lot of people were really skeptical when this story came out in terms of Manti and his involvement, you know, whether or not he was involved and could somebody really be that naive and all those different kind of things. I mean, you got to remember, this was, this was like, you're going all, like, when this started, you're going all the way back to 2009, when this is just getting started. And then, you know, so like you're 2009 and then 
you know, the crescendo is 2012, 2013, but social media is really still in its infancy at that point. You know, Facebook, Twitter, now I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't around, but I'm saying it's not what it is today. And just like, like today, it is much more common for people to have relationships, long distance relationships, whether it be on social media, you can throw Instagram in there. Obviously, you've got the dating websites, you know, and again, like the dating websites were still relatively just getting started back then. So I think so many people had a hard time believing, how could you have this relationship with this person long distance and call them your girlfriend, but you never even met them? I mean, like, they do a whole TV show about this today. It's called 90 Day Fiance. These people are literally all the over the world. <laughs> well, that, that too. But I mean, I guess my point is it is much more common today. It's much more, I think, easy for people to believe that a long distance relationship like this could, you know, could be going on. I I understand what you're saying and I agree. And you got to put yourself in that 2009 mindset, but, but, on some level, if it's 2012 and you've never met, you've never seen a picture live or video chatted live because it was always too dark or the connection didn't work, there has to be more red flags. So I'm not saying that he was a well, part of it at all. No, I'm you're, just you're saying, right. There, you know, there I'm were. Saying that there's still was, a little bit of naiveness or a little bit of something. And that's that's off. what I was going to say. Like I'm not going to you know claim to know Manti Teo personally, but I was in that media you know, throng back right. then. And Manti Teo was, you know, like, especially publicly. Now, everyone is a little bit different behind closed doors than what they are out in public, especially when there's microphones and cameras in front of you. He was a very soft-spoken person. And like, even well, they had Manti's parents as well. We forgot mm -hmm. about that. It's like Manti was like, you know, one, the whole thing kind of, the, the relationship started because he thought this person that he was having, you know, some kind of connection with online to whatever degree was having some kind of problems. And so it kind of snowballs from there. He shows some concern, some care, and that's where the connection really starts to build. And he, he really was a very trusting, caring, and the key word naive person. And I, and I don't say that as a pejorative, it, he, he was a naive person. And, you know, like, again, talking to his parents, you can, you can see that. So, you know, I can, I, and then once, Heart. once you know, once the story blows up and becomes what it is, it has already snowballed to a point where if you're Manti, how are you going to get out of that? And again, I think they well, captured that pretty well in this documentary. Well, hold on, because you're right. You're absolutely right. But I think that part of it's the culture, too, and like the family, the, the idea of family and connection. And I feel like every time, and they don't really touch on it, and I don't know how you actually could, and but every time it was about to end or not continue that the person on the other end kept their, they had cancer or they got into a car wreck or, and then eventually the death, but they kept stringing along Manti. So every time, was, yeah, was there was always an excuse. Yeah. Cause you're For, right. There every time it was about flags. to be done, then yeah. somehow it came, they fished him back in. They kept fished him right back in. And it, to me, at some point it's like almost too, I mean, we looking at it through the, the blinders, you know, now that we know what happened, I guess when you're in the yeah. moment, but you can't tell me that. Well, let's, some let's, of their down. Let's let's get off like whether he did, whether he didn't, all right. that. Let's let's stick to the documentary sure. a little bit here. So, what's what's maybe the biggest thing you learned out of all this? I guess I just didn't. I didn't realize how long it had been going, and I didn't learn how close they were, like throughout the beginning and then the whole time. That it, and then that this person had catfished other people that Teo had reached out to. They show that in the documentary and he's like, Hey, do you know who this is? And they were like, yeah, I know who that is. And I just, I didn't know any of that. So it makes sense that they would have catfished other people, but I learned that. And like I said, just having the people so close to it, you hear the um, Teo's parents and Swarbrook and that Swarbrook maybe found out earlier than what they let on during the time as it was happening. I think that's what I learned the most. Yeah. It, what I mentioned, the fact that it took just five days, you know, for these two reporters to dig all this information up and the amount of information and detail they were able to get in the whole thing. And again, I get people are going to be skeptical of what, you know, they did or didn't do. But, you know, that, you know, that was part of it. Um, the other part of this is that I, I, I kind of always thought that there were multiple people involved in this, not just Renaya. 
And again, Raniah is the person behind this. At that time, he was from the Los Angeles area, played high school football, was a quarterback in high school. And I think it was as Stymie pointed out, a, you know, a Polynesian, yeah, homesick and, you know, an, a Polynesian connection, you mm -hmm. know, which kind of helped build that relationship with Manti. You know, so it was actually Man, or it was actually Ronaya doing not just the voice of Lene, but there were other voices that were in there as well. And I mean, like even on on uh, what Dr. was supposed Phil. to be Lene's Facebook account, oh, yeah. Ronaya was supposed to be her cousin. You know, so like he gets tangled in to this whole thing, and they actually met and hugged each other. You know, Renaya hugged Manti after the USC game outside the Coliseum in Los Angeles as the cousin, you know, sort of a sympathy hug and all this stuff. And I think that's when really, you know, this this kind of takes me into, the, you know, the next biggest thing I, le uh, I learned. So Renaya now has transitioned from male to female. And to me, like from... I'll just I'll use the pronoun her because that's what she goes by now. It sort of it it sort of explains her infatuation and you know her strong infatuation with Manti and the lengths that she went to to continue this ruse. You know, I basically think she was in love with Manti, and and that's what you know led to the you know to the to the whole catfishing scam. Very confused person back then who has since transitioned. Sure. Um, that's interesting, too, because some of the stuff that they were talking about, and like one thing that I didn't realize, and I don't know if anybody would, because at the time we didn't know what was going on, was the junior year decision for Manti to come back to Notre Dame yeah. or go pro. And Manti leaned on this relationship that he thought he had with this Linnea that he didn't. Um, again, nobody knew that advice. at the time. Yeah. <laughs> But and the, it almost seemed like the vibe I was getting was the parents were like, "Go pro, we can use that money. It'll help everything. <laughs> we're ready." And um, the fact that Notre Dame fans should almost be appreciative of Linnea for for um, to ask Sopo for convincing uh, Teo to come back because that year yeah. was pretty magical. But I didn't realize that how much it wasn't just like he had a girlfriend that he talked to on the telephone. It was someone that he shared intimate details and made major decisions in life about. Was there a point when you were watching this documentary when maybe you were still skeptical or on the fence one way or the other, you know, about how you felt about this whole saga, but then you saw this and it really changed your thinking after seeing or hearing it? No, not necessarily. I, you know, it's so, I know it's a long time ago, but it's also still kind of recent at the same time, if that makes any sense. So to me, it was it was interesting to see all sides and the way Teo. I, what I was appreciative of is that Teo was raw with it, and um, he shared a lot of his life and shared a lot of his thoughts through the whole thing, during the whole breakdown of it, and then afterwards. So it almost made me feel not that I wasn't sympathetic before, but it's like wow, you really went through a whole lot. Even more sympathetic now yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. and. You know, we should say, because I don't think we've said this, you know, like not only did Renaya take part, I mean, she copped to everything, like everything, the yeah. whole, how she, you know, plotted all this out, everything she did, the voices that she did. And you also saw her go, go on the Dr. Phil show. And I had kind of forgotten about this. He asked her, cause he, he had voice analysts once Manti, Manti released uh, some of the voicemails with the girl's voice on there. And so Dr. Phil, you know, and again, everyone can have their <laughs> opinion about Dr. Phil and that's perfectly fine, but he gets, it's just crazy that he ends up in the middle of this whole thing, but he has Renaya on. He's got these voice experts from the FBI and the government analyzing the audio. And they're saying, you know, like 90 something percent, this is not you. And so Renaya goes behind kind of this, this curtain and kind of has to sort of get into character, I guess, is the way they explained it. And then all of a sudden, here's the, ex you know, here's the voice that we heard on the voicemails. And it was coming, you know, from behind the wall. That was, that was pretty jarring just to hear that. But I think the biggest thing for me, because I, I always believed Manti's side of the thing. Because like, I, 
you know, again, like we go back, we didn't even talk about this. Like when we found out about this, I remember I'm standing in my kitchen, I'm cooking dinner. All of a sudden, I think my boss, you know, emails me the story and it's like, what am I reading here? And the next thing you know, within two hours, I'm over at the Goog at Notre Dame and Jack Swarbrick is doing a press conference and he brings up the term catfish, which I, it's like, I had no idea what he was talking about. And like they said, Manti's uncle told him at one point, I think you're being catfished. And Manti had never heard that term before. I, had you ever heard the term catfish before any of that, Bobby? No, I hadn't. And I hadn't heard of the show on MTV that was obviously, I guess they had already started filming. But I think the way that you describe that Twitter, Instagram, Facebook aren't the same now as they were back then. Mm-hmm. Back then, they also weren't as they were a couple of years ago. So that I think this story just happened at just the right time as everything right. was his infancy. And he became a poster child for it. And that's really why it exploded. It wasn't nobody yeah. had of any prominence has ever had that happen to them. Yeah. So, you know, you look at through those glasses, too. And like, how do you navigate out of it when you're the first person that's ever gone through it? And I think that the documentary did a great job of that. But no, I'd never heard of the term catfishing before. I think the thing, though, like if you watch this and maybe you were skeptical of Manti's side of this and see if you agree with this or not. He gets that phone call in early December and all of a sudden, you know, it's like, it's me, man, Ty, you know, it's Lane, whatever she said. And he's like, whoa, you know, blown away. Yeah. You know, first he, he thought someone was just screwing with him. And then, I, you know, he, he basically ends up saying, if it's really you, then I want you to take a picture and I want you to have today's date in the picture. And I want you to have this certain sequence of letters that was supposed to mean something. And I want you to do, is this like the hang 10 thing? You know, like the the two fingers and the thumb. I want you to do that. So Rania, again, because the girl in the photos, her name was Diane O'Meara, who Rania had gone to high school. And he didn't know her well, but he knew her a little bit. And they had had some contact over the years. So he texts her and says, take this pic, you know, do this, do all these things. Take this picture and send it to me because it's for this person who could really use some help. And, you know, he likes you and, and all this kind of stuff. So she does it. Rania sends it to Manti. What the hell are you going to think at that point? When you see the person you thought was dead doing all these things that you just said, if you send that picture, then I'll believe you. And here comes that picture with, you know, within a couple of hours. <laughs> like, what are you, supposed what would to you even be thinking you... at that point? What would you be no. thinking? The whole time you, well, I think you think a lot. I think you think that, <laughs> I think you think, oh God, what have I been going through? Oh God, was this real? I think you think a lot of things that are, are crazy, but the picture itself, obviously the person that took it didn't understand what they were a part of. Oh but, yeah. She, but she my, had no clue. Right, she had right. no clue. And like the, you know, the one but snippet of, of, of her talking, it's like, yeah, keep thinking. Like, yeah. And they're they're a victim in this as well because they they didn't deserve to be a part of it, but they are. And I just I can't believe that somehow Renaya reached out to get that photo and it worked. I wonder what Renaya, what message Renaya, I want to know exactly. I would love to know all of that. Like, what was their thought sending a message to ask for this? Because at that point, they're not friends. They're not cahoots. It's a random person. So obviously, and geez, how would you not think that it? at worst that they're real right maybe the death thing but like geez how could you that that was that was the point of the documentary that was like what yeah so then within a couple of weeks manti goes to jack swarbrick you know in the administration prior to the national championship game and says i think my dead girlfriend might be alive and it's like what (laughs) you know so they start going through okay let's not say anything publicly just yet you know, they start getting their ducks in a row. And, you know, and from Notre Dame's perspective, they're obviously, you know, working on how they can do some damage control because that's kind of what, what Swarbrick was talking about. They've got all kinds of consultants and all these different people. So there's, you know, all these different conversations going on before the national championship game. And then, boom, January 12th drops when the tip comes in. And, they and that was contact. Oh, my gosh. That was the toughest part for me to watch was the 
they didn't spend too much time on the national championship game as they shouldn't. I don't think any viewer did either because no, it was no. a blow. But that was almost really tough to watch because you yeah. just everything was crashing down around him. Well, I was it, there. It was really tough to watch. <laughs> I bet really I bet tough. Manti had a rougher time than you did with that no, game. No, you're you're absolutely right. Saw my boy Michael Birch pat him on the back though, coming up through the tunnel, former Notre Dame SID. SID nice over guy, there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But so uh I can't the like that was the, now. That was a rough part to watch because, and we all remember that game being a blowout. But then seeing the highlights of Teo just making missed tackles, and you know his life's in shambles, and his psyche can't be good, and everything that was so good all year just crashed down. And almost like the whole problem he had with this catfish that was only, you know, the two hour documentary about what four months of, of real time world. It's like that three hour football game just, it was devastating. Every part of his life was crashing down. Yeah, absolutely. Who do you think most needs to apologize to Manti? I mean, there's two obvious answers, I guess. I I think a lot of people that were questioning him need to apologize, but obviously the apology needs to come from Renaya. And I'm glad that at the end of the documentary that he kind of lets himself um, – not apologize to himself, but he lets himself off the hook. Well, he, like. he got the uh, he, he got the goodwill hunting treatment. You know, Robin Williams. It's not your fault. That that whole thing from a psychologist he was talking to. The guy was like, "Have you forgiven yourself? Because it's right. not your fault." And and I mean, I think that was a great point that that someone probably need to impress upon him. But you know, like the whole anxiety that he went through, and like. You know, he, he's talking about people who would come up to him and say, hey, can I get a picture with you? And then, you know, so they get a picture with Manti Teo and then they walk away and they start laughing. Oh, it's the guy with no girlfriend, you know, that kind of thing. It's like going through that, all the, you know, because, again, he's one of the nicest people that you're going to meet. And to go through those kind of things over and over again and to be, you know, taunted and heckled in NFL stadiums. And the whole thing, and you know, to wonder what your teammates are thinking about you through all that kind of stuff. I just can't even sure. imagine. Well, I so who do you think needs to apologize the most? I mean, Renaya has obviously got to be public enemy number one in this situation. Well, she did. Then- I mean, she did apologize, you know, so that's at least out. You know, I don't know if she said it necessarily in the documentary, you know, but she said that she has apologized. She definitely apologized right before the story came out, and you know. At least yeah, that's too late, <laughs> but, but she, but also she has at least fessed up to everything. So, you know, so again, I, we don't know exactly. I, I, I think that just in general, anyone who's ever made fun of Manti for any of this, if you watch this, if you don't completely feel differently afterwards, then, you know, you're, you're, you're like minus five on a scale of one to 10 on the human scale. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, those are the to, people who need to apologize to Manti Teo. Well, look at it this way. It, his life was very public and it was very embarrassing. And the strength he had to go through that and become an NFL player, because he could have just shut it down and been like, you know what? I'm not going to risk getting heckled at all these games by all these fans. Could have just gone off and done something else, I'm sure. But the fact that he was strong enough to face this and go through it, what was the most embarrassing? I'm not, you know, share. I'm saying like out general. What's the most embarrassing moment of your life? And how right. many people would you want to know that embarrassing moment? Right. And there's and there's I'm, nobody. There's I'm, nobody I'm that would. About, I'm, I'm just saying. Tripped on the stairs. There is nobody that would want the whole world to know the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to them, or the worst thing that's ever happened to them. You wouldn't want that to become public. Right. And that's what happened to me. But it's not like even like the most embarrassing out moment. Public. Right. It's not like your most embarrassed moments like falling down the stairs or look, right. look at all the people that get canceled on Twitter culture and stuff. The most embarrassing thing of your life, you want the whole world to know and then become the face of it. Like if you were the first one that tripped, you know, like it's a terrible example, but I'm saying his was so exponentially more embarrassing. And the fact that he stayed strong enough to himself and his beliefs and his values, it's it. I think that no matter where you were, even if you were completely on his side, now on that one to 10 scales you were talking about, now you're an 11 even more on his side <laughs> because just the fact that he could face it and that he agreed to do the documentary and agreed to show his side. And like we said, I saw somebody in the chat. Yeah, he's made a lot of money, but his reputation will always be that he was the catfished guy. Yeah, I'm sorry, but 
having a few million bucks doesn't make up for any of this. You're still a person. And whether you have a stack of money sitting over here or not, everyone still has feelings and they still have to go out and function in public somehow. And when you're a public figure, there's even that much more scrutiny on you. So having well, some money, you know, that'll, that'll obviously pay the bills and, you know, get you a house and a car and whatever else, but you still, you still have to live with yourself and, you know, live with, with you know, your family and, and friends and everybody else for the rest of your life. You know, you still well, like, you still have to figure some things out. That's why MTV had the show Catfish already, because it's such an embarrassing, people are fascinated by it. And like the fact that he was just the first person, like I already said, of prominence that yeah. was already active. It wasn't like he was a retired well, guy. It's just crazy. Stymie that, just pointed out, like he wouldn't have ended up with the Chargers. He wouldn't have been the number 38 pick. Cause like, you know, you know, like one of the things that stood out to me too is just mm -hmm. the rush and the speculation about his sexuality. Everyone wanted to know, is he gay? And I mean, they're talking about this on news programs on TV. And I remember doing a radio interview with someone in another market talking about this. And the last thing they asked me is, so do you think he's gay? And I said, look, I don't think that that matters one iota. And it's, you know, like it, it how is, how is that even relevant to this conversation? And it's not something I'm going to speculate on, you know, and, and that was, well, that was I the don't end know. of the interview. And I just can't believe that you had these, you know, I'm like, like they had a, a Mike Florio on the Dan Patrick show clip and Florio was saying every NFL team wants to know is Manti Teo gay. Right. And I don't know your timeline of when you did that interview from when the story broke, but it seems like that whole story was big for, you know, it's still big. That's why there's a Netflix documentary. But I think that people started to question that because it was, was he a part of the story? Did he initiate someone doing Linnea right. so that he had an excuse to be? Right. And like you said, even like when that became abundantly clear that he didn't have any part of that and that his life was, was shattered. I don't understand why anybody would even care about that. I, the guy got catfished. It didn't mean that he's gay. It doesn't mean he's straight. It doesn't mean anything. It has nothing to do with the story. Right. It's 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 disappointing even in 2012 that that was how the culture was. So I feel like yes, that's still exactly. kind of relevant these days. But hopefully, people are more accepting and not so judgmental or accusatory or even curious about something that doesn't matter. When the story was he got catfished, his life was in shambles, and he's still trying to become a professional athlete. And here's another thing we haven't really brought up. He was how old? 21. I mean, yeah, that's incredible that he could go through all that at 21 because a lot of people wouldn't be that strong. And that's something, you know, you know, I don't know about you. I mean, you you, you fall more on the skeptical scale than I do in general, um, not on this, by the way. Right. In general, I'm, yeah. I'm saying in general, <laughs> like I remember when I was in that teenage to early 20 years, I would call myself a very naive person as well. And there were a couple times I was taken advantage of, you know, because not, not to obviously to the extent that we're talking about here, but those kind of things happen. And it's like, you learn from them and it, it definitely changes you as you go through life. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 either you're going to continue to fall prey to those kind of things, or it's going to harden you in some ways and, you know, and it's going to change you. But I would say that you know, again, like when you go back to the naive Tay that Manti had, I being, you know, we were all that age at one point. And I'm not saying everyone was completely naive, you know, in, in it all depends on your life experience that led you to that point. But again, I was, and I, I can, I can easily see where that, you know, where he could, where someone could fall prey to that kind of thing. And it's like Stymie says in the chat, his strong faith made him a rich target for national media. And that's kind of the, the, if he was just a normal player, if he was just an average guy, it wouldn't have been as important. But the fact that he was so rich in his faith, that he was such a, a strong human, a leader. And he was, when he got to Notre Dame, they touched on it in the documentary, how much of a leader he was his first year, you know, before the first game even. And you, you get something like that. And, if he had been a guy that had a DUI or something, I'm not saying they wouldn't have made a big deal about it, but it wouldn't have mattered as much. The fact that this clean guy that's done everything right, that said every right word, that's led in every right way, that's led by faith, all of that 
any way they can trip him up, the national media wanted to see him trip it up. It rolls into the story. It rolls yep. into the story. And that's – let's do some rapid fire. How about that? All right. We'll continue, but we'll do some rapid fire. So the Deadspin reporter, Tim Burke, again, interviewed in uh, the Manti Teo documentary. He claims that he slash Deadspin saw the story as a chance to expose mainstream media. The reporter, you know, says he thought it was going to be a story about how places like ESPN, Sports Illustrated, the New York Times fell for a hoax without properly fact-checking their stories. So do you buy or sell that as the motive, Bobby? I completely sell that because I think, I don't think it was them trying to call out ESPN or SI. And I think their selfish propaganda was to maybe that they had a real story because they were almost like page six before that, kind of like a we throw random stuff out. And this was a story to legitimize themselves and put themselves as the same as Sports Illustrated and ESPN. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was a knock at them. I think it was more of how they could position Deadspin to be that brand that's almost like an edgier, more young, hip version, like almost before Barstool. They, I think that's what they wanted to be. They wanted yeah. to be the, the brand that competed with SI and ESPN, but in an alternative way, but they had to have this legitimate earth shattering story. And that's what they wanted. I don't think it had crap to do with them trying to expose ESPN or SI because well, it just doesn't make sense. Well, I'm going to read. I went back and read the original Deadspin article, you know, the, from January 16th, 2013 today. And I'll read you the lead here in a second, but I'll, I'll start with this. Cause like, I do think that it is, at, at the very least, nice revisionist history for Burke to be saying this, but it also, sure. by saying this... He's had 10 years to come up with well, it. it. Well, it shelters him from potential, you know, lawsuits from someone like Manti. And, you know, and that's that's never been, you know, now there are obviously things that have to be proven. And, you know, if you're, you know... But let me just, I went back and I read the original story. Here's how it begins. This is from, this is the lead into the Deadspin story. Quote, Notre Dame's Manti Teo, the story said, played this season under a terrible burden. A Mormon linebacker who led his Catholic school's football program back to glory. Teo was whipsawed between personal tragedies along the way. In the span of six hours in September, as Sports Illustrated told it, Teo learned first of the death of his grandmother, Annette Santiago, and then the death of his girlfriend, Lene Kakua. Kakua, 22 years old, had been in serious car accident in California, and then she had been diagnosed with leukemia. SI's Pete Themmel described how Teo would phone her in her hospital room and stay on the line with her as he slept through the night. Quote, her relatives told him that at her lowest points, as she fought to emerge from a coma, her breathing rate would increase at the sound of his voice, Themmel wrote. So he points out, you know, uh, that there were a lot of, and we saw this in the documentary, there were a lot of discrepancies in when did Kakua actually die compared to when the grandmother died. Like if you looked at the ESPN story, the New York Times story, the SI story. Um, so I guess at least my point is, like you completely sell that he was going after that, you know, like, and again, like you keep reading this, he starts to mention some of the other, you know, national traditional media outlets that I just mentioned, SI, ESPN, the New York Times. He definitely is taking shots at them in this. Now, you can also say that he's kind of, you know, like it got to a point. Here's what we know about Manti. He was an exceptional football player, expected first round pick, devout Mormon at a Catholic school adores his family. Here's another quote, but that's where the definite ends. From here, the rest of Teo's public story begins to grade into fantasy in the tradition of so much of Notre Dame's myth-making and with the help of a compliant press. Again, he's taking a shot at the press right there. Assembling a timeline of the Kakua Teo relationship is difficult as Teo's celebrity swelled. So did the pile of inspirational stories about his triumph over loss. Each ensuing story seemed to add yet another wrinkle to the narrative and details ran athwart one another, end quote. So like, again, like he's taking some shots at the media, but that right there to me 
kind of implies some complicity on Teo's part, I think. What do you think? Uh, again, I, I'm not going to back down. I think that Deadspin wanted to, Deadspin to be the the part of the story. It, they took advantage of this kid that had a problem, and I, or a situation, not a problem, but and, and whoever got it would have. That, but the, the fact that they did it, I don't think that they were, like, again, I don't think they were taking shots. I think they wanted to join that club, and this was their card into that. They had a chip on their shoulder. Yeah. Yeah, and so – for them to even mention the other ones, number one shouldn't mention number two in a competition like that. So right. the fact that they're reaching out, like at that point, there would never been an SI or ESPN that mentioned Deadspin until they broke this story. Then they had to attribute it to Deadspin. And you can't tell. I would like to know what their Twitter followers for Deadspin went from that week because it, it exponentially helped Deadspin for what they were. And I, it just it, – it, The irony now is – you know, even less than 10 years later, Deadspin is dead, <laughs> you know, so. I don't think it is because I think they were taking shots and they weren't as good as they thought they were to begin with. So it, it's no surprise that 10 years later, they rode the wave and crashed out again. I yeah. I just think they wanted to, that was their one chance. And they you have to shoot, shoot your shot. There's a lot of money to be made there. And Tim Burke, who would know who he is? Where would you ever see him if they weren't the ones that broke the Teo story? So I, I don't by a single second they were going against all of media. I think they were looking for a way to join that media club. Yeah, I don't I don't doubt that, you know, but, but I yeah. you're saying that they put little crumbs he, in their articles does, that he could did, show he, that. I will say this though. He did point out, again, he did this in the documentary. He did point out <laughs> validly that there was a gross lack of fact checking on all of these national media outlets part in any of this. The story was told, the story, you know, like one one fable essentially stacked on top of another and the story kept going and nobody bothered to, you know, check the facts and all this. Like a simple, you know, because again, this is 2012. They were doing online obituaries in 2012. There's an obituary for Manti's grandmother. It's not very hard to find out that there was not an obituary for Lene Kakua, let alone an article or, you know, a news report or, you know, a police report, I guess I should say, a police report, because wow. that would be easy to check. There is no police report that had Lene Kakua in a car accident. You know, so like two very easy things to fact check right there, and everyone just overlooked it and kept on running with it. Then I get what you're... I, I'm just anti dead spin. No, I know. And, and I'm not, I'm and, not saying that in their right, defense. Right. I'm just but, saying that there are valid things so that he pointed I, out I was, about the lack of fact checking. I was just going to say, but I can understand that that, that was a lack of fact checking and it yes. really was, you know, kind of shoddy, but like you're, I think when you're covering him, like any celebrity that's dating a non-celebrity, I don't care what this, the story is. Google the non-celebrity and everything that pops up on Google is going to be so-and-so is dating so-and-so. It's not going to be about that other person's life. <laughs> right. So, like, the right. fact you – well, I know that you know, where it could too, been. Because, like, you know, my wife is really into, you know, like, Entertainment Weekly or whatever. Right. And, you know, all the different, you know, those kind of, you know, like, E! News and all the celebrity gossip and all those different kind of things. And, like, when Tony Romo was playing, she would ask me about, like, you know – Obviously, when Tony Romo was dating Jessica Simpson, everyone knew that because it was Jessica Simpson. But it's like, you know, what I thought about Tony Romo's new girlfriend. And I'm like, Tony Romo has a new girlfriend. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm a sports fan. I don't care what happens off the field. I only have, you know, I only care about what goes on when they're between the lines. I don't oh. care about this other fluff stuff, you know, and that's sure. that's how because, you know, again, like you go back to this, there wasn't a whole lot of local attention paid to this it was more from the national level i think that this came up right but i'm saying that like they've they created their own google net that like you couldn't google her because all that would come out was that she was mantai's girlfriend or was dead yeah so you would you would have to go so to it was the all exact sort of city attached where to, it happened yeah yeah that's and the, i'm or, not or so why would you or you had to be tim burke with his computer you know web and because again but he he you, did he did all of his work sitting in his house, basically. Months later, though, because nobody – even Deadspin, even Tim Burke, it wasn't like they thought, hey, 
I wonder, let's do some fact checking. They got tipped off. So it wasn't even their idea to start doing the tipping right. off. So I, 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 gonna, do wish, I do gonna, wish we know who the who the tipper, who the tipster was. I don't know <laughs> if they ever found that out. That would have been. Um, but like, you know, who's going to think about this poor kid going through all this? Because he was very genuine through it. And as a guy that covered him, you and me both, we never questioned it. We never even thought to question it. Why would you question a kid going through that kind of tragedy? So <laughs> we got we got a better call. Saul reference. Jeeves. Stymie 2012. Just as Jeeves. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> but so I don't I don't I, there was some obvious fact checking that could have been done. But you're also looking at a situation. Why would you fact check that a guy's girlfriend died when he's a legit dude who's been nothing but awesome right. this entire who, time and a great man? Who, so yeah, I, I understand who's where they're forthright coming forthright in every other interaction, you know, seemingly forthright in every other interaction. that you. And we had already with. accepted that he was dating her. Like, you know, yeah. we'd already heard about her. We already knew she had cancer. So the fact that she passed, we're not really thinking about, oh, I wonder if we should just let's go look at the obituary. No, you know, obviously there's some holes there in the catfish story. But yeah. so the fact that Deadspin made themselves part of the story, I guess you have to. Whoever's going to uncover it's going to. I just. It's not like uncommon, that. though. It's not uncommon. You know, I know. For, I understand for, it. For a certain kind of reporter, it's not uncommon. But you talk to about who needs to apologize the story. most, and Deadspin gained the most, so maybe they're the ones that should be apologizing. Yeah. Deadspin, for at least the way they, they yeah. treated it. And but not, they never would. They never would, and they never will. Because, like, in their mind, and this is this is how the mind of most of these reporters work, the story is the only thing that matters. And, like, when they got this tip, it became a challenge you know, based on all this information they got in that email, it became a challenge to get to the bottom of this. And as they as they started going down these rabbit holes, again, they found it out pretty quickly. The story is all that matters to the reporters. The story and how accurately and how much you can back up, you know, what you're presenting. And they tried to call Manti. They tried to call the school. They tried to call Renaya. Couldn't get any official comment with that. So they went with what they got. And whether we like it or not, and whether, you know, whatever angle they were pursuing at first, it all ended up being true. Yeah. It, and I, the, the way that everything hit, the timing of it, the, the Heisman Trophy, the championship game, the fact that Catfish was a relatively new thing. Again, and Teo was a budding celebrity, budding star. All of it just hit at exactly the right time for the exact right nerve. Because if that happened yeah. in August, you might not even heard about it as much. The mm -hmm. fact that it came out during the national title Middle of the right season, after. And yeah, that, Michigan State. And, and I'm yeah. trying to remember, was that the same time, the same year that Brian Kelly was flirting with the Eagles? Yeah, well, that was in December or I guess January right after the national or before after the national championship. I think it was yep. just after. Same time. But, same time. But, yeah. So it was it was crazy that how much Notre Dame was in the public eye already. Right. And then like the coach is already flirting and then plus Notre Dame in general. So polarizing, I think they need to touch on that a little bit more that no, this guy from yeah, Notre I mean, Dame. That, like, that, that fueled a lot of the, the anti Manti as well is, is yeah. the fact that he played for Notre Dame. Not, not just that it happened to some guy. Cause if it happens to in a Oregon, guy from Iowa even, state, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Who cares? Yeah. yeah. So it's just, I think, and the reason we can do a whole hour on it, we've had a lot of comments about it. It's, this story still matters uh, 10 years later. It's still, you remember where you were, you remember going through it, you know, either thinking you're on his side or not. It's just wild. Yep. All right. Let's, let's switch topics because like you said, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about the Manti documentary. And again, I, I it was a pretty good documentary. I it thought. was very, yeah, yeah, overall very full documentary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. yeah. So <laughs> as of today, Notre Dame's a 15-point underdog in the season opener against Ohio State. Let's talk about something actually on the field. Where are you going to put your money, Bobby? Notre Dame plus 15 at Ohio State, according to FanDuel Sportsbook as of today. Oof. <laughs> I guess I will take – I got to take Notre Dame with that money or with those points for that money. Um, one, just – just the way the betting world works. Yeah, with those odds, sure. But I think – I don't think Ohio State's quite as good as people think they are every year. I think last year they took a small step backwards. So it'll be interesting to see. And Notre Dame has a bunch of question marks on their own. But to say the game won't be within two touchdowns, I think is just unfair, disrespectful. Almost More than two Dame. touchdowns even at 15. Yeah. yeah. So I, I completely would take Notre Dame in the points. 
I agree with but you as well. That's an like, interesting number, though. Yeah. 15 is a lot. You know, it has been a lot over the course of the summer, but they are still 15 right now. I would I would jump on it as well because, as you see, there's still, whether you've got a new defensive coordinator or not, there are still some issues with what they've got. Like, there were issues with Ohio State's linebackers last year. They got run over by both Oregon and Michigan. So, you know, un unless they're drastically switching up personnel, whether you got a new defensive coordinator or not, that's an issue. And I think that I think that that Notre Dame offensive line has got something to prove this year. And we've talked about Chip Harry on their Heastand. shoulder, huh? That's right. We've talked about Harry Heastand, and and you know we've heard from Al Washington, the defensive line coach, about how there's some battles going on during training camp between those two lines. We knew the defensive line was good and uh, that offensive line is more than holding its own. And then Marcus Freeman said today that, uh, you know, the biggest thing that he's encouraged with is his offense is the development of a running game. And that is obviously <laughs> something that was completely, not completely, but pretty absent last year. They could not run the ball consistently. Like if, if, if they could run the ball at all, they could have run some clock in that Fiesta Bowl, and maybe we're you know looking at a different outcome. But that's going to be different this year, and you get you've got a dynamic quarterback added into the mix who's going to be a big part of that as well. So I like that plus fifteen for Notre Dame. I would uh, I would that's where I would be dropping my dimes. And last year, their best run of the season was against North Carolina, when the line completely broke down, and he had to break three tackles to go ninety six yards or whatever. So you know. Yeah, always hit the like button. Um, <laughs> I I don't see, especially a, a game with so many variables, just to put that spread so big. I, another fun bet, and I don't know the number, uh, last year you asked me Notre Dame's wins for the season over under. It's always a fun one to discuss at this point in the season, but there's a lot of question marks. I think there's more question marks this year than there were last year. See, I don't think so. I think there were more last year than there are this year. I think the biggest question this year – was what was going to happen with that offensive line. I think, you know, now there's some depth issues and stuff like that, but that offensive line is going to be seriously better than last year's. And well, that's not saying a whole lot either. No. <laughs> seriously better, though. You're saying they're going to be a major improvement. But like I'm saying this year, yes. you have a coaching staff that's a lot of question marks. Your quarterback's new. That's a big question mark. I, you know, you lost a lot at receiver, so there's some question marks. Whereas last year, I think the only question mark really was the offensive line. And Notre Dame, you figured if you look down their schedule, they should win most of their games, and they did. Yep. On average, Bobby, seven teams that start the season ranked in the top 25 will be out of the top 25 by season's end. So what three teams in this year's top 25 will you guarantee will not be ranked at the end of the season? Man, that's a... Do you have the list, or do you need me to read any of these? I'm looking up the list you sent me. You sent okay. Me list. So, okay. <laughs> Somewhere in here. Okay, so Notre Dame, I think they'll still be ranked. I think Utah falls out. I think Baylor falls out. I think NC State falls out. I think USC falls out. I think Ooh. Pittsburgh falls out. I think Arkansas falls out. Kentucky falls out. Wake falls out. BYU falls out. Well, that's more than, that's more than three, so you're giving me all seven. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just think there's well, there's a whole, especially towards the bottom. It's kind of a it's a fun See, talking they, point, but like Kentucky, they had their run. They're not going to be very good this year, so they agree. fall out. Yeah. And then you you know you got like Michigan State. They're going to have to play a lot of tough games. I don't know if they can stay in with losses. And then a team like Baylor, I think they fall out because I think part of it's that they're going to lose a few games and their conference isn't strong enough that after they lose those few games that they have enough points to get back in. Um. And then BYU is always ranked 25th to start the year, every year. And then they, all, they, you know, they flirt with it a little, but they always end up dropping out. See, someone's giving you a hard time here. You only needed three, you know, and, you, and of course, Bobby ran through his whole list there. So uh, just, um, I, I think the thing with the, with the two Pac-12 teams, Utah and USC, you know, again, there are questions with USC's lines, but they've got <laughs> enough, they've got enough skill talent on offense and, the new head coach playing in the Pac-12, even if they lose two or three games, which they probably will, th they should still be in the top 25 by the time the season's over. The same with 
Utah. I think Utah is, you know, and that's it's a, a big part of the the two seasons of both of those for both of those teams are going to come down to that game. I think Utah probably wins because they're going to be much more physical up front. But you know, so I don't. I, I still like both of them to be ranked as much as I would like to say, ah, USC, get out of here and that kind of thing. I think Pittsburgh is going to fall out. You know, you just lost a generational quarterback to the NFL draft, Kenny Pickett, and Pat Narduzzi thinks that, you know, he's he's built some kind of dynasty there in Pittsburgh. Okay, Pat Narduzzi, uh, we know you like to talk a lot. You know, you've got a contract extension. Let's see you actually go out and do it two years in a row because now all of a sudden, oh, we could win the Big Ten and – and the whole thing. Okay, Pat Narduzzi, let's see. I think Pitt's going to be out. I agree with you. I think Kentucky is going to be out. I just think it's too hard really to win at either one of those places in back-to-back years. And I'll, I'll put Miami in there as well. Like Cristobal is going to be good in the long run, but I don't see him making a huge impact in year one. So those will be the three teams that I'll pick, Miami, Pitt, and Kentucky. Yeah, and I don't know. I you see BYU, and they have to have a, some key wins to stay in there. And I don't see that happening for them. I I know that the, I don't like preseason rankings in general. They're just talking points for matchups on television. But um, yeah, and plus the top sixty teams are offered bowl games, so you really got the top twenty five is an arbitrary number. But I think yeah. of all those that were mentioned, I think Kentucky's the number one. That I'm like, there's no chance they can survive the SEC and still be ranked at the end. And now I would probably put Texas in that group as well. They were not ranked in the AP; they are in the coaches' poll. So, like, if you wanted to use, you know, both polls, you can include Texas. To, you know, Texas is just—I mean, that's—they're they're just Texas. They're, they're back every year. Let's let's see them actually be back. Well, they just got to hang around for one more year till they get Manning in the fold, and then that's going to be their key to success. Or sorry, there you go. There you Sarkeesians go. Either going to sink or swim with that shot to the top, skyrocket high. Okay, yeah. Barrett. This is kind of a fun one here. Barrett Sully from CBS Sports and XM Radio tweeted a list of X uh, SEC coaches, rather a list of SEC coaches. He ranked them from one to fourteen in the order he thinks they could win a fight. So here we go. Brian Harson from Auburn is number one. Clark Lee, he's got number two. Mark Stoops is three. Kirby Smart is four. Billy Napier from Florida is five. Shane Beamer at South Carolina is six. Arkansas's Sam Pittman is seven. Ole Miss Lane Kiffin is eight. Eli Drinkwitz from Mizzou is nine. Josh Heupel at Tennessee is 10. Jimbo Fisher at AM is 11. Then Nick Saban. Brian Kelly at 13. And he's, he got, from? <laughs> <laughs> and he's got Mike Leach bringing up the rear, the old pirate down at the bottom. At number 14. So my question to you, Bobby, that's one through 14. And this is, he's ranking these guys based on who would win a he, fight, who would win a fight. So who's ranked too high? Who's ranked too low? Well, I think that uh, Lane Kiffin at number eight is way too high. That guy looks like he has a punchable face that everybody yes. would jump on. I don't yes. see him throwing one back. I just see him eating a knuckle sandwich. I, I don't see him being resilient. I think he'd punch him once and he'd start crying and pouting. I don't see um, him lasting in a fight. And then another one I think is too high would be Nick Saban. The guy's 97 years old. You really think he's going <laughs> to win in a fight? Who's Nick Saban fighting that he can throw a punch? He can barely well, stand at the podium 12, to give though. his I damn mean, uh, press conference every week. Somebody's got like, – like between Nick Saban and Brian Kelly because he's got Saban at 12, Kelly at 13. Who are you going to take in that – in that little back alley brawl. Kelly's I would got Saban. With, I got to go with Kelly. Like I say, you see Nick Saban running around or anything? No. Kelly gets animated. He screams. He's got that Irish anger in him. He does have that There's Alley a lot going for him where Saban would be like, well, okay. Yeah. He's got that Alley Cat temperament. That's for sure. But I don't know. I still think, you know, Saban looks like he's in a little bit better shape. I know BK, you know, has done some yoga and stuff over the years well brian kelly's in great shape he's been dancing with recruits on videos all off season true true obviously a joke there but then the <laughs> one ranked too low i would say mike leach does anybody really want to get in a fight with that madman <laughs> i don't think i'd want to see him in a dark alley i think he's got size he can absorb the punches i believe 
I think he can like outthink you. He'll make you think and start punching yourself or something. He's crazy. He's a madman. That's a guy I don't want to mess with. It'd be like messing with John Daly on a golf course. Now, you know, like some of these other guys, like Harson, Clark Lee's obviously in really good shape. You know, again, like you talk about temperament, you know, like Stoops was taking shots at John Calipari last, you know, we were we were talking about that earlier. <laughs> Kirby Smart, I don't know about at number right, four. Yeah. Napier is like another guy who's in pretty good shape. You know, so we're talking about some of these younger guys. I think maybe Sam Pittman is a little bit high at number seven. I agree with you. Kiffin is too high, probably. Drinkwitz, though, for sure. Like, Drinkwitz just looks like I saw him at SEC Media Days, and he's got his Diet Coke, and it's like he's, he's glad. He looks like he he came from like the corporate world, I think, and and got into coaching, and that looks like where he should be. Drinkwitz, I think he's got to be number fourteen on this list. I think Jimbo Fisher is way too low. Like Jimbo, you know, like you uh. can say what you want about like where. You, you know, like his shots going back and forth with Saban and all that in an actual <laughs> alley fight, I would put Jimbo pretty high on this list. I would There's, put him right up there. Well, Vince Daddario, he, he said, where would you put Freeman on this list? That's an interesting one. I'd put him in the top at least eight. He'd be ahead of Kiffin for sure. He's 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 ahead of Kirby Smart for me. He's ahead of Mark yeah. Stoops for me mm -hmm. um you know he's got size on clark lee you know i don't know i don't think clark lee wrestled you know he played football he played baseball like if clark lee with that build if he had been a wrestler i would take you know i would take him over marcus freeman but i don't think he was so i would i think i'd take I, freeman would definitely be in my top four if we were you yeah. know if if he was going to be in this mix i think i'd put him at number three probably and then the only other name that I could think of that isn't a coach, but you kind of got to throw him out there is Ogeron. Where would you put that guy? Oh, if Ed Ogeron. That's right. All right. I'd be in the top 14 at least. <laughs> He'd have to be top 14. He'd be ahead of, of – I can't believe Nick Saban's even on this list. You breathe on that old man, he'd fall down. <laughs> He's got to be close to your age, Sean. Uh, oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs> Fill in the blank on this last one. I didn't realize we had come to the end. It's blank that more people watched the Seahawks-Steelers preseason game the other day than watched a regular season Yankees-Red Sox game. It's a sign of the times. I I don't think it's surprising at all. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, any that's why we have the USFL. What about the USFL? How many of their games compared to baseball games? I think in baseball, especially if it's like Red Sox-Yankees, Unless you're a fan of the team, how many people actually will sit down and watch just two neutral teams play? Whereas football, we're so thirsty for any th football content that I think anybody anybody would watch anything football related. So yeah. I think it's just a sign of the times. And it, it's baseball is just not a national sport anymore because I'm sure in New York and Boston, you know, like local local TV for baseball does great. National TV does not so it's almost apples to oranges at this point you know again I, mm -hmm. i'm sure in new york and connecticut and massachusetts obviously in, in new england i'm sure that a lot of people were watching those games because those are two of the best baseball markets there are in the country but you know you're sitting here it's football people are hungry for football people are probably watching this one because you've got all this legalized sports wagering across the country so people have got some action on it even on preseason games one right. way or the other. And two, you're getting ready for fantasy football. So it's like you're you're tuning in, trying to figure out who am I going to draft in my fantasy football draft. So I'm I not guess. I'm not surprised by it at all, but it 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 does seem odd that you know, like the biggest rivalry in baseball was less watched nationwide than a preseason NFL football game. Week one what? NFL preseason football. It'd be game. interesting to see the quarterlies on this because I think the, the, always the thought is that the Yankees and Red Sox go so damn long with their games. They play each other 19 times, and it's five hours long every time. Versus the football, it's new, it's back. But the, the thing that's weird is that it's one of the most storied matchups in baseball versus a random two pairing of NFL. It's not like it was even big NFL teams. So I guess it's kind of interesting. I wonder how long people stayed around with the – NFL game after halftime and how many tuned in to the end of the Yankees Red Sox game, maybe, but just overall, the numbers don't surprise me at all. Bobby, 
we've come to the end and it's the end of the week for the show that's yeah another week down the drain that's right baby vince and i are gonna be out of football yeah vince and i are gonna be out at notre dame tomorrow watching a little notre dame football practice so uh we'll have some of that on next week's show some things that we see brian driscoll of course will have some on uh his shows over the next couple of days as well two weeks from saturday kickoff baby it's coming and i think brian and i were talking i think that you know vince and i are going to be doing this game day show every saturday morning before notre dame games i think next week we are going to do kind of like a preseason show so if you play your card rights cards right maybe we'll even let you come in and and be a part of that i'll give you something to say we need some comic relief (laughs) yeah looks aren't everything (laughs) that's right that's right (laughs) all right well we appreciate you being here like rate subscribe review all that good stuff have a great weekend and we will talk to you next monday bobby i will talk to you later ib nation sports talk